Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another video and welcome to the first proper video in my guide to Victorian authors. Today we're going to be talking about 20 authors from Abbott to the Brontes and hopefully it's going to be a good time. So I have 20 authors to get through today. Um, we're beginning with Edwin Abbott and we're going to go through to the Brontes. Yes, we are not even getting fully through two letters today, um, but there were a lot of Victorian authors whose names began with A and B. So there we go. So we're going to start right at the beginning with Edwin Abbott. Edwin Abbott was born in 1838 and died in 1926. He was a school teacher, an Anglican clergyman and a writer. He was from London um, and his full name was actually not Edwin Abbott, but Edwin Abbott Abbott. His father was called Edwin Abbott um, and for some reason they decided to give Edwin Abbott Jr. the middle name of Abbott. The only reason why I can think why they might have done this is because Edwin Abbott's mother, her maiden name was also Abbott because his parents were first cousins um, and sometimes in the Victorian period you might give a mother's maiden name to a child as a middle name. So I think they just gave him as a middle name his mother's maiden name which was the same as his father's surname and therefore his name was Edwin Abbott Abbott which is generally a very silly but exceptionally Victorian name. Edwin Abbott was mostly a non-fiction writer, he wrote some history books, some theological books um, and he also wrote a book called Shakespearean Grammar about grammar in Shakespeare so that's fun. But since the Victorian period he has become most famous for his sort of science fiction-esque slash mathematical novella Flatland. I have read Flatland, I didn't love it, um, but it is kind of fascinating. So the full title is Flatland, A Romance of Many Dimensions. This is a book from 1884 and it is about a two-dimensional world. So it is set in a world where instead of there being three dimensions there are only two and it's a weird mathematical experiment. It is one of those sort of Victorian science fiction fantasy kind of novels that don't have much of a plot and it is also like deeply sexist. So it's kind of one of those Victorian works that I would say is worth approaching with academic interest rather than expecting something massively fun but it is kind of fascinating and the mathematics behind it um, and his kind of exploration of what a 2D world would be like is really really interesting. So that's Edwin Abbott. And next let's talk about Charles Warren Adams. So Charles Warren Adams was born in 1833 and he died in 1903. He was a lawyer and a writer and he also also wrote under the pseudonym Charles Felix. In general, throughout this guide to Victorian authors, um, whenever there is an author who wrote under a pseudonym, I am cataloguing them and alphabetizing them by the surname of the name they were most known for. Charles Warren Adams was kind of involved in the early detective fiction world. Um, so the book by him that I have read is this. This is The Notting Hill Mystery from 1865. The Notting Hill Mystery is often claimed to be the first detective novel written in English, although I do have some rival claimants for that position to mention later on in this video. It's a really interesting novel in terms of form and genre and within it an insurance investigator gathers together a lot of different evidence um, around a man whose wife has died and he has claimed um, life insurance on her death and he thinks there is something suspicious going on here and we follow through a lot of different letters and articles and reports and um, diary entries in order to work out what happened. I really like this um, and I would definitely recommend it um, and I I'm keen to read some more by Charles Warren Adams. Um, I think the other book that I'm curious to read by him is another crime novel called Velvet Lawn from 1864. So hopefully I'll get to that at some point in the future. So next we come to William Harrison Ainsworth, who was born in 1805 and died in 1882. Ainsworth was a novelist from Manchester who trained as a lawyer as well, actually. Quite a lot of lawyer writers actually in the Victorian period. Anyway, he actually never practiced as a lawyer because he wanted to focus on his writing and he wrote chiefly historical fiction. He also very much moved in the sort of literary circles of the Victorian Victorian period. He was friends with Charles Dickens. He edited a literary magazine. Um, he was part of the kind of London literary world, especially in his earlier career. He had quite a lot of success earlier on in his life, um, but over time his books started to become a little bit less popular. He was pretty prolific. I think he wrote over 40 novels, although in comparison to some Victorians that's nothing. Like there were plenty of people on my um, guide to Victorian authors who wrote well over 100 books. Anyway, I think his best known books are probably Rockwood, um, which is actually just from before the Victorian period. That one came out in 1834. And then Jack Shepherd from 1839, Old St Paul's from 1841 and The Lancashire Witches 
from 1848. The only William Harrison Ainsworth book I have read is The Lancashire Witches from 1848, which I did not love. I read this very, very recently, so maybe my dislike of it will fade slightly over time, but I was not impressed by The Lancashire Witches. I didn't love the story. I found the characterization quite weak. I found the plotting very odd and the writing was quite dull and stodgy. Like my main initial impression of William Harrison Ainsworth is that he has like all of the wordiness of Dickens with absolutely none of the flair. However, I have only read the one book by him um, and I know that a lot of people do love him a lot. So it might just be that he's not the right author for me or that I started with the wrong book. I don't think I'm in a hurry to read anything more by William Harrison Ainsworth in the immediate future, but I will probably revisit that in five years and try another one, so we will see. The next author I want to mention is Grant Allen. He usually wrote under the name Grant Allen, although he did publish a couple of novels under a female pseudonym, Olive Pratt Rayner, which is obviously um, unusual for the Victorian period. There were quite a few female writers who published under male pseudonyms, um, but I think Grant Allen is the only writer I've come across who was a male writer who sometimes published under a female pseudonym. Grant Allen was born in 1848 and died in 1899. Um, he was actually born in Canada but he moved to England as a teenager. He moved around quite a lot actually in his life. He also lived in the US, France and Jamaica but he ultimately settled in Britain and his writing career kind of all took place while he was living in England. As well as being a writer of fiction he also wrote non-fiction. He was actually a scientific professor as well as being an atheist and a socialist so in general a very interesting man. He was a real kind of promoter of the theory of evolution and was really kind of inspired by Darwin and some of his early non-fiction works are about kind of science and biology and plants and stuff like that. There are quite a few Victorian authors in my guide to series who I have read something by but didn't know that much about their life um, and I feel like some of them are just absolutely fascinating and Grant Allen is definitely one of them. He was a very productive writer within quite a short space of time from like the very late 1870s to um, when he died in the late 1890s he published over 40 books some of which were non-fiction some of which were fiction and within his fiction he wrote some realist fiction and also some science fiction. The one book I have read by him is a novel called The Woman Who Did from 1895 which is a sort of new woman novel. I have mixed feelings about The Woman Who Did. Basically it is the story of a woman who doesn't want to get married because she considers marriage within Victorian society to be very very unequal and to not promote kind of equal gender roles. So when she meets and falls in love with a man she says well I am happy to live with with you but I'm not going to marry you and so they live together have a child together but don't get married and the book kind of follows um what happens to her and I feel like it's one of those new woman movement novels that is like simultaneously both really radically proto-feminist and also quite reactionary and conservative so I kind of would recommend it but I also feel like if you're after some feminist Victorian literature there are books that are a lot more feminist than the woman who did there are a few things by him that I am quite keen to read at some point um so there's one novel from 18 1991 called Recall to Life, which I don't know too much about, but that title to me sounds like a reference to A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, so that makes me intrigued. And I'd also like to read some of his science fiction because that sounds really interesting. So there's one novel from 1895 called The British Barbarians, which is a time travel novel, so I'd kind of be interested to read that. And he also wrote a short story called The Thames Valley Catastrophe in 1897, which is about the destruction of London when a volcano explodes. So that sounds really interesting, doesn't it? It, I definitely want to read some more by Grant Allen. The next author I want to talk about is F. Anstey. This was the name he wrote under but his real name was Thomas Anstey Guthrie. Um, he was born in 1856 and died in 1924 and he was a Victorian comic writer from London who worked as a lawyer again. I haven't yet read anything by F. Anstey um, but he's best known for his novel Vice Versa which I am really keen to read. The full title of Vice Versa is Vice Versa or A Lesson to Fathers. This book came out in 1882 and it is about what happens when a father and a son swap bodies. So I think it's like the first Freaky Friday style story that was ever written um, and that sounds really really interesting. I didn't know that like trope went all the way back to the Victorian period. He wrote many other books um, most of which I think were kind of lighter comic novels. Um, he did publish one serious novel called The Giant's Robe which apparently George Gissing scathingly said was very poor stuff which definitely doesn't overly include me towards it considering how highly I think of George Gissing but I also feel like that's quite mean of Gissing so who knows maybe I'll read vice versa first and if I like that I might try his serious novel too. The next author I want to talk about
now is Elizabeth von Arnhem. Um, Elizabeth von Arnhem was born in 1866 and died in 1941. Elizabeth von Arnhem is obviously mostly known as a 20th century writer. She's probably most famous for her 1920s novel, The Enchanted April, but she was actually writing during the Victorian period as well and had a few books published before the end of the Victorian era. Elizabeth von Arnhem was born in Australia, but she moved to England when she was about three years old um, and grew up in England. Um, although later in her life, she also lived in Switzerland, Germany, the US and France and also England again quite a lot. I'm counting her as a British Victorian author for this series, but it definitely seems like she was quite an international person. She also has some interesting literary connections. Um, so she was the cousin of Catherine Mansfield, um, well known as a 20th century short story writer, and she also had an affair with H.G. Wells. So I've read two books by her, one of which is The Enchanted April, which as I said is from the 20th century, but I have read one of her Victorian books, that's this. This is Elizabeth and her German Garden from 1898, which is a diary form semi-autobiographical novel about a woman who finds kind of comfort in her garden um, while escaping her husband who she doesn't necessarily like that much. I will be interested in reading The Solitary Summer from 1899 which I think is kind of a follow-up to Elizabeth and her German garden and I'm also quite interested to read her 1901 novel The Benefactress which apparently is about um, a young woman who has been out in society for some time and hasn't yet found herself a husband and so her sister-in-law intervenes to try and get her married. Next we have Matthew Arnold who was a Victorian poet. He was born in 1822 and died in 1888 um, and he was a very very successful poet during the Victorian period as well as an author of non-fiction books. He was a professor of poetry at Oxford University and he also worked as a school inspector. His first volume of poetry The Strayed Reveller was published in 1849 um, and he went on to publish a lot of poems throughout his life. He wrote quite a lot of poetry examining faith and religion in interesting ways and his best known poem um, which is probably my favorite to be honest is Dover Beach. I've read quite a few of Matthew Arnold's poems mostly kind of in anthologies and collections with various other Victorian poets. I really like his poems and yeah especially Dover Beach is really really great. Next let's talk about R.M. Ballantyne. Ballantyne was born in 1825 and died in 1894. He was a children's author from Edinburgh who wrote over a hundred books during his lifetime. Some of them are sort of children's adventure books um, and some are stories for very very young children sort of nursery rhymes and that kind of thing. Apparently he was a big influence on Robert Louis Stevenson so if you have read books like Treasure Island and enjoyed that then it might be worth giving R.M. Ballantyne a go to. I have not read any of his books yet but I do as you can see have one of his books on my TBR. This is The Coral Island which I think is his most famous book by quite a long way and I am really interested to read this one. This came out in 1857 and it is the story of a few schoolboys who are stranded on an island after they are shipwrecked um, and they have to survive by themselves and if that premise sounds at all familiar this novel was apparently the inspiration for the Lord of the Flies but I gather that um, Golding when he was writing The Lord of the Flies looked at the coral reef and thought I don't believe children would ever behave that well I'm gonna write what I think would really happen so I think it's probably a lot less dark than The Lord of the Flies anyway I'm curious to read this at some point in the future the next author I want to mention is Sabine Baron Gold he was born in 1834 and died in 1924 and as well as being a writer he was also an Anglican clergyman he actually wrote quite a lot of hymns including the hymn Onward Christian Soldiers which is quite famous so that was one of the interesting facts I discovered about Baron Gold as I was looking into him as an author. He also spent quite a lot of time collecting folk songs and folk tales um, and published some sort of folklore studies later on in his life as well as his novels and his short stories. I have not yet read anything by Sabin Baron Gold um, but I will be reading The Roar of the Sea imminently. It is on my Victober TBR and I haven't started it yet but I'm really determined to finish it by the end of the month bearing in mind that I am filming this video before you are seeing it in the last week of October. So at some point I will read In the Roar of the Sea. It is a novel from 1892 and I know that my fellow Victober co-host Kate Howe absolutely loves it and has raved about it a lot. I gather it is a sort of gothic novel set in Cornwall about a young orphan and some smugglers and some shipwrecks and all of that kind of drama. It sounds very Daphne du Maurier at Actually, um, and I'm really keen to get to it soon. The next author we're going to be talking about is another poet and that is Elizabeth Barrett Browning. She was born in County Durham in 1806 and died in 1961 um, and she was probably the most famous female poet of the Victorian period sort of within her day. She was very very successful. She had a very interesting life and I'd kind of love to read a biography of her. She struggled with her health and was chronically ill throughout her life 
and she also married another very famous poet Robert Browning who we're going to be talking about tomorrow um, because Elizabeth Barrett Browning comes under Barrett and Robert Browning comes under Browning um, so they're not sitting together in my alphabeticalization. Anyway Elizabeth Barrett and Robert Browning had a really interesting courtship story. Um, he read her poems and loved them so much that he wrote her a letter basically saying I love your poetry so much that I've fallen in love with you and then they met up um, and she knew that her family wouldn't approve of this courtship and um, she knew that her father thought Robert Browning was a fortune hunter um, so they got married privately in secret um, and after of their marriage her father disinherited her and apparently Elizabeth Barrett Browning's father disinherited all of his kids who married. I feel like she was probably better without him. As I said she was a very successful poet within her time um, I guess one of the reasons why she kept her maiden name as well as her married name and um, which was relatively unusual at this point in time was because she was very very well known as a poet as Elizabeth Barrett. Her poetry often includes social themes including proto-feminist themes and she campaigned for the abolition of slavery both within her poetry um, and within her wider life. Elizabeth Barrett published her first collection of poetry when she was 20 years old and she was very successful throughout her life. She's best known today probably for her 44 poem sequence of love poems that she wrote um, about her husband Robert Browning called Sonnets for the Portuguese. You will have probably heard the sonnet how do I love thee? That is Elizabeth Barrett Browning. So I have read Sonnets for the Portuguese and various other poems and sonnets by her and then I've also read um, her novel in verse Aurora Lee. In general I really like her poetry um, and I really enjoyed her novel in verse. I think Aurora Lee is fascinating, really really underrated and well worth your time and I think also if you're someone who sometimes struggles with Victorian poetry then it's worth trying this because it is quite accessible. Yes it is written in verse but at its heart it's also just a building's romance and if you're not used to poetry you will still be able to enjoy the kind of buildings roman coming of age story elements of it it also has some really interesting sort of proto-feminist um things to say and although I feel like there are a few ways in which the kind of proto-feminist vision of the novel slightly lets itself down but I do think that for the 1850s when it was written it was very ahead of its time and it's really worth a read. The next author I want to talk about is Cuthbert Bede. No that was not his real name. Um, his real name was Edward Bradley um, but he mostly wrote under the name Cuthbert Bede. He was born in 1827 and died in 1889. Um, he was an English clergyman and writer from Worcestershire and he studied at Durham University um, which is where he got his pseudonym from St Cuthbert and Bede being two historical figures sort of very associated with Durham. He wrote a lot of comic columns for newspapers and journals um, and he wrote some comic novels too. I've never read anything by Cuthbert Bede before but um, the thing he's most famous for and the thing I'm most curious to read by him is The Adventures of Verdant Green which was serialized during the 1850s and is a comic novel about the experiences of an Oxford undergraduate. I always enjoy kind of campus fiction and I haven't read that much campus fiction from the Victorian period to my knowledge there isn't that much campus fiction from the Victorian period. I guess the closest I've read is Charlie's Aunt by Brandon Thomas which is a play that takes place at Oxford University but that's from the 1890s so I would be quite interested to read a kind of portrait of university life in the 1850s. This one's been on my TBR for a while so hopefully I'll get to this soon. The next author I want to mention is a playwright and that is Florence Bell who was born in 1851 and died in 1930. She was born in France to Irish parents but moved to England later in life um, and wrote a few plays and some novels uh, which I would be interested in reading. I'm especially interested to read Alan's Wife which is a play from 1893, um, a one-act play about marriage and infidelity. That one sounds really interesting and Florence Bell is definitely an author I want to get to at some point in the future. The next author I want to talk about is R.D. Blackmore. R.D. Blackmore was born in Berkshire in 1825 and he died in 1900. And he was a pretty successful well-known Victorian novelist, best known for his historical romances although he also wrote some sensation fiction. He also worked as a school teacher. Um, I feel like so far definitely the most common professions for authors um, in the Victorian period seems to be lawyers and teachers and clergymen actually, quite a few clergymen as well. R.D. Blackmore is best known for his novel Lorna Doon which is the one book by him I have read. This came out in 1869 um, and has continually stayed relatively popular. It's one of his only books that has remained in print. A lot of the rest of his novels have been really really forgotten. It's a historical novel set in 17th century Exmoor. It's kind of like Wuthering Heights meets meets Romeo and Juliet. Um, it's got this like wild setting and these warring families and these two young people from opposing sides of this feud who fall in love. I have not read it since I was about 14 or 15 years old but I loved it as a teenager and I really really need to one reread it and also read some more 
by R.D. Blackmore. The main book that I am keen to read by R.D. Blackmore is Clara Vaughan, his novel from 1864. This has been on my like vague radar and TBR for so long and I just have never got round to reading it and I really should. It is a sensation novel from 1864 with a female detective figure so that already sounds really interesting. It's about a young woman whose father was mysteriously murdered when she was a young girl and now that she has grown up she sets out to uncover the identity of her father's killer. Clara Vaughan is another one of those novels um, that some people claim is the first detective novel written in English. You may notice that it came out the year before The Notting Hill Mystery and as I have already said there are a lot of novels which claim to be the first detective novel but you know it's one of the early works of detective fiction. Interestingly R.D. Blackmore initially published Clara Vaughan anonymously and readers at the time all thought that it was by Mary Elizabeth Braddon like that was the leading theory. So one, I think that's really interesting, but also I love Mary Elizabeth Brown's writing style. So that kind of makes me even more excited to read Clara Vaughan if it's going to feel like Lorna Doon meets Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Um, so looking forward to reading that one at some point, hopefully soon. The next author I want to talk about is E.L. Blanchard, um, who was a playwright who wrote both under his own name and also under the pseudonym Francisco Frost. He was born in London in 1820 and died in 1889. Um, and he is best known for his pantomimes. Don't know whether you expected me to feature a pantomime writer in this guide to Victorian authors but he was a very significant playwright within the Victorian period. He did write some sort of regular plays but he was best known for his Christmas pantomimes um, and he wrote a new Christmas pantomime every year for nearly 40 years so you know that's kind of fun isn't it. The next author I want to talk about is another playwright and that is Dion Boussico. He was born in 1820 as well um, and died in 1890. He was born in Dublin but later settled in London um, and then spent several years later on in his life living in New York. He wrote apparently about 150 plays so you know very prolific productive man um, and he specialised in kind of melodrama and farce I'm holding up here London Assurance, his play from 1841, which is the only thing I've read by him. I really, really enjoyed London Assurance and I would really recommend it. It's a great silly farce with a lot of glorious silliness in. It's very funny. I would really, really recommend it. And I definitely want to read some more by Dion Boussico because I enjoyed London Assurance so much. I only read that very recently. So there are a few plays of his that I'm interested to read. Old Heads and Young Hearts from 1844 sounds like it is probably in a kind of similar vein to London Assurance. But I'm also quite interested in reading his 1852 play The Vampire, which, you know, I'm assuming is about vampires. I'm currently reading Varley the Vampire, a Victorian vampire Penny Dreadful. And between that and Carmilla by J. Sheridan Le Fanu. I'm kind of getting really interested in Victorian depictions of vampires um, and especially like vampires pre-Dracula. So at some point I should give The Vampire by Dion Boussico a read as well. The next author I want to talk about is Mary Elizabeth Braddon. She was born in London in 1835 and died in 1915. She wrote over 70 novels and she was a really key sensation writer. To explain what sensation novels are for anyone unfamiliar with the term, basically sensation fiction was a genre with in the Victorian period, very popular in kind of the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, that had kind of like dramatic sensational elements, often including adultery, murder, scandal, secrets, lies, um, bigamy. These books tend to have a lot of mystery, a lot of drama, um, sometimes quite a bit of melodrama. And they're both slightly over the top and also really wonderful. I very, very much enjoy them. And I would say the two kind of really big names within Victorian sensation fiction are Mary Elizabeth Braddon and Wilkie Collins. Braddon actually had a fairly scandalous life herself for a Victorian woman. She worked as an actor for many years years before becoming a writer um, and she lived with a man named John Maxwell who was married to somebody else and living separated from his wife. They lived together not married for a little over a decade um, until John Maxwell's first wife died and they were able to get married. For the Victorian period that would have been fairly scandalous. Mary Elizabeth Braddon as I said is best known for her sensation novels but she also wrote some supernatural novels featuring ghosts and that kind of thing and she also wrote some novels on the slightly more realist less sensation end too. So I've read three of her novels. I've read Lady Orderly's Secret from 1862 which I really really enjoyed. This is the tale of family secrets and drama, um, an investigation into a mysterious disappearance and possible death and so much more. It's really 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 good. I've also read Aurora Floyd from 1863. I enjoyed this one quite a lot less than Lady Orderly's Secret and I would say it's probably not a good idea to read them back to back as I more or less did because they borrow some plot elements from each other which you know if you write 70 novels I think is completely fair enough but I wouldn't necessarily read Aurora Floyd and Lady Orderly's Secret close together 
and there are also certain elements of Aurora Floyd which age really really badly. In general if you're someone who reads Victorian literature you are sometimes going to encounter really unpleasant uncomfortable attitudes within Victorian novels and sometimes they are background and not a major element of the novel and sometimes they are a major element of the novel so I wouldn't necessarily recommend Aurora Floyd as much as I would other books by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Then most recently I read The Doctor's Wife from 1864. This is much less of a sensation novel but it definitely has a lot of like gentle loving mockery towards the sensation genre. This book is Mary Elizabeth Braddon's like take on Madame Bovary um, and I really really liked it. In general I will say that I absolutely love Mary Elizabeth Braddon's writing style like even in Aurora Floyd which I didn't like as much as a novel I feel like her writing is just so easy to read and so thoroughly enjoyable so I am really keen to read more by her. So there's a few things that are on my TBR for Mary Elizabeth Braddon. The next two things I want to read by her are both shorter works. I've got her long short story The Fatal Marriage um, in a collection of short stories and I'm also quite keen to read her Christmas story The Christmas Hirelings um, which I know Kate Howe said a while ago is absolutely delightful and then I've also heard really good things about her first novel The Trail of the Serpent from 1861 which is another novel that people have claimed is the first detective novel in the English language and this one predates both The Notting Hill Mystery and Clara Vaughan so you know I definitely need to read this at some point. I very much enjoy that literally three books that I'm talking about in one video have all had people claim they are the first detective novel in the English language. And then there's one other novel by Braddon I am really keen to read at some point and that is Dead Men's Shoes from 1876. Mostly just because I love the title. What a great title, Dead Men's Shoes. I just want to read that one. Anyway, the next author I want to mention is Charlotte Braum. Maybe Charlotte Braim? I'm not 100% certain how to say her name. She was born in Leicestershire in 1836 um, and she died in 1884. She worked as a governess before her marriage and she also of course was a writer. Her books were pretty popular at the time but she also had a lot of issues with piracy and plagiarism and basically a lot of her books were reprinted in the US under a different name Bertha M. Clay without her permission and that apparently like had a really big impact on her kind of financial um, success as an author. She was another of those very very prolific Victorian authors. She wrote a hundred plus novels mostly kind of like sentimental novels um, with some sort of sensation elements. I gather she wasn't really like a full sensation writer but she sometimes dappled a little bit with the sensation genre. I haven't read anything by her yet but I have heard good things about Dora Thorne from 1871 which was her most successful novel. Apparently this novel is about some cross-class love stories which is a theme I'm always interested in Victoria in literature so I'm definitely keen to read that one at some point. Then I'm also quite interested to read her novel The Duke's Secret just because I really enjoy the title. It sounds like so entirely a Victorian sensation novel. In fact it either sounds like a Victorian sensation novel or a Regency romance um, and I'm just kind of enjoying that. The Duke's Secret is apparently about um, this duke who falls in love with an American heiress who has some kind of mysterious hold over him so that sounds kind of fun doesn't it? And then finally the last three authors I want to talk about in this video are the Bronte sisters. So I'm going to talk about the Bronte sisters lives together because obviously their lives have some crossover and then I'll talk about their books individually. The Bronte sisters were all born in Haworth in Yorkshire. The eldest was Charlotte who was born in 1816 and died in 1855. The middle sister was Emily who was born in 1818 and died in 1848 and the youngest child was Anne who was born in 1820 and died in 1849. They also had a brother Branwell and two elder sisters who died in infancy. The three sisters all wrote poetry and novels and, and they are are probably the most famous female Victorian writers. I guess probably the Brontes and George Eliot um, and then maybe Elizabeth Gaskell would be like creeping up behind them but really not quite reaching the same heights. And within the Bronte sisters it is fair to say that Emily and Charlotte are definitely a lot more famous than Anne. Anne is a truly fantastic writer as well but definitely gets a little overlooked. The first thing the sisters published was a collection of poetry which they published in 1846. I had in my head that this collection I have here was um, poems from all of the Bronte sisters but actually it's only Emily Bronte's poetry um, but I thought I would hold it up anyway as a symbol of the poetry of the Brontes. After they had published their collection of poetry they went on to write individual novels. Um, they were all pretty young at this time in their um, 20s uh, maybe early 30s for Charlotte and their novels have gone on to be very very much loved. All three Bronte sisters died really young. Both Anne and Emily died of tuberculosis. Emily
Emily in 1848 when she was only 30 years old and Anne in 1849 when she was only 29. Charlotte then died in 1855 at the age of 38. At the time she was recorded to have died of tuberculosis but we actually think she probably died of complications during pregnancy. The general consensus now is that Charlotte Bronte died from kind of excessive morning sickness. In general the place where they lived, Haworth in Yorkshire, was hugely unhealthy. Um, there was a report in 1850 done into public hygiene in Haworth, which discovered that the average life expectancy for people living there was 26 or 25. I don't know whether that includes like infant mortality rates, so maybe it would actually be higher if you had survived into your adulthood, but regardless, wasn't a great place to live. Their father, Patrick Bronte, outlived all six of his children, which is exceptionally sad, but what a talented family they were. So let me talk about each sister's books in turn, and we'll start off with Anne Bronte, because this is a A to Z, alphabetical guide to Victorian authors. So Anne published two novels, um, Agnes Grey from 1847 and The Tenant of Wildfell Hall from 1848. I love her books so much. I think she is such a talented writer. Agnes Grey is the tale of the kind of everyday life of a governess. It's a really enjoyable novel and it probably is an easier entry point to the Brontes than quite a lot of their other books. And then The Tenant of Wildfell Hall is a much more ambitious and stronger novel, I would argue. Like, I really like Agnes Grey, but I love The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. This is the story of a young man who falls in love with a mysterious widow who has recently come to the neighbourhood and finds out more about her past and her very unhappy marriage. It is a truly, truly wonderful novel. Um, it is so proto-feminist, so fascinating, amazing themes. I really, really recommend it. And then next we have Charlotte Bronte. So Charlotte Bronte is, of course, best known for her first novel, Jane Eyre, which was published in 1847. I love Jane Eyre a lot. It is the novel that got me into Victorian literature as a teenager and I still maintain that it is a great place to start with the Brontes, to start with Victorian literature in general. It's a really wonderful buildings roman about a young woman called Jane Eyre, her childhood and her new role as a governess in the mysterious Thornfield Hall. Her next novel was Shirley from 1849, um, a kind of industrial novel, um, chiefly focusing on the friendship between a young woman called Caroline and her new friend Shirley. It also looks at unrequited love and industrialization and workers' rights and in general it is a really interesting novel. Then the final novel published during her lifetime is Valette, which was published in 1853. I love Valette a lot. I think it's really underrated and I think it's a novel that if you read Jane Eyre and you kind of loved it but you were also a bit unsatisfied with it then I feel like Valette is worth trying. It is a story of a young woman called Lucy Snow who moves from England to Belgium in order to become a teacher there. It is a wonderful meditation on unrequited love, mental health, loneliness and so much more and I really really love it. Charlotte Bronte did write one other novel, The Professor. This was published posthumously in 1857 although I believe that she wrote it first before for any of the rest of her books, but didn't manage to get it published during her lifetime. I am not a massive fan of The Professor. I basically feel like a lot of the ideas and plot lines that were used in The Professor Charlotte Bronte then revisited and recycled for Valette and I feel like they've done a lot better in Valette. The Professor is about a young man who moves from England to Belgium to become a teacher in a school. Um, you can see that there are some similarities with Valette already and although I do like it and it is Charlotte Bronte and it's great, um, it is definitely I think the weakest of her books for me. I feel like you might be tempted to start with The Professor because it's Charlotte Bronte's shortest book, but I really wouldn't. I think it's one for Charlotte Bronte completionists to read, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it as much as her other books. Then finally, let's talk about Emily Bronte. Um, before I speak about the amazing glory that is Wuthering Heights, I wanted to briefly talk about her poetry. As I said, the sisters all write poetry and publish a volume together. But generally, the kind of critical consensus since the Victorian period has been that Emily Bronte was the most skilled poet of them all, and I think I would agree. I do like all of their poetry, and I have read bits and pieces of their poetry here and there, but Emily Bronte's poetry I've read the most of, and I love the most. She writes a lot of kind of fantastic, atmospheric nature poetry, um, amongst other things, and yeah, I just really recommend her poetry a lot. And of course, I very much recommend her amazing novel, Wuthering Heights. Now, Wuthering Heights from 1847 is a wild strange book that some people adore and some people hate and it's one of those novels that I really understand why people don't like it. If someone tells me that they didn't enjoy Pride and Prejudice I don't understand why. Like I can't really understand how anyone could read Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen and not enjoy it in some way. Whereas I can absolutely understand how someone could read Wuthering Heights and not enjoy it. It is such a strange, weird, wild, demonic, terrifying book. But goodness do I love it. So Wuthering Heights is 
is one of my favorite books of all time. So is Jane Eyre and probably The Tenant of Warfare Hall too, but not to the same extent as Wuthering Heights. This is one of my most reread books ever. I think the three books I have read the most times are Our Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens, Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, and Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. And I think Wuthering Heights probably still just about beats Pride and Prejudice for the amount of times I've read it. This is the weird and wild tale of various families living in the Yorkshire Moors. Specifically, we follow the Earnshaw family, what happens when they adopt a mysterious young boy called Heathcliff, how Heathcliff um, falls in love with one of the daughters of the family and all the chaos that ensues. This is not a love story. This is a revenge story. And it is the story of a lot of twisted, toxic people all making each other's lives worse in the most terrifying way. It spans two generations. We have various frame narratives with various unreliable narrators. Everything is chaotic, but goodness is it good. What a genius book. And what a great book to finish on in the first episode of my Guide to Victorian Authors. So today we have been through 20 wonderful Victorian authors. Well, I haven't read all of them, so I don't know that they're all wonderful. And I think, in my personal opinion, I'm not sure I do think William Harrison Ainsworth is wonderful, and I probably don't think Edward Abbott is either, but we have been through 20 Victorian authors. So please return tomorrow for the next instalment of my Guide to Victorian Authors, where we're going to be talking about authors from Bulwer Lytton to Dickens, um, with a lot of authors in between. We'll be talking about Lewis Carroll, Wilkie Collins, Diana Mullet Craik. Um, I feel like tomorrow's video is going to be very long. I have some big heavy hitters um, in tomorrow's video, but I'm very excited to tell you about all of them. So that is all for now. Thank you very much for watching. Please do let me know your thoughts down in the comments, and I'll be back very soon with another bookish video. Video. who was born in 1851 and died in 1980 that's not the case that would be impressive